Thanks. Thank you. Well, Ed, thanks, thanks to you. I mean, you've put together a wonderful program. It's been very successful. Uh, probably more than a thousand students have gone through your summer school. So that's just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's thank Ed. Yeah. <laughs> So the question was, turbulence chemistry interaction, and when is it important and when is it not important? And as I say, in the classic textbook diffusion flame, as long as you're mixing the fuel and the air, is it working for you okay? Mixing the air, or bringing the fuel and the air together, you have in a reaction sheet, in the ideal case, uh, all of the heat release. All right? So in that limit, Kinetics plays no role whatsoever, as long as the kinetics is fast enough to be able to process this fuel molecule and this air molecule that have been brought together. All right? You agree with that? That's the classic textbook diffusion plane. And it turns out that under uh, uh, conventional diesel operating conditions, the diesel flame or the diesel spray is surrounded by something that looks very much like a diffusion flame. So that's why I'm saying that the uh, kinetics is really secondary. The thing that is important is the turbulence, which is in training the air into the, into the fuel, bringing the two together, and it's determining the rate of combustion. The, the mixing is controlling the rate of combustion. The other extreme, if you have a homogeneous charge engine, for instance, and you compress the mixture, <coughs> Or if you have a shock tube filled with fuel air, already mixed fuel air mixture, and you send a shock wave through it to raise its temperature, you will have a reaction occurring kinetically. There's no turbulence in that uh, situation. So engines fall in between those two limits. And if you're looking at a, um, a diffusion flame, you're more or less in that limit where it's turbulence mixing controlled. If you're looking at a uh, homogeneous charge compression ignition, it's purely chemistry. The spark ignition engine is in between because basically you cannot get a flame to propagate unless you heat up the gases, the premixed gases, ahead of the flame. And how do you do that? Through turbulence diffusion. So in the spark ignition engine, turbulence chemistry interaction is crucial. Right? That's what makes the flame propagate. Does that help you? So, so some of the literature that you referred to was looking at uh, combustion regimes that were not, you know, the uh, the, the high load diesel, uh, conventional diesel operating point. They were looking at um, cases with high EGR rates and so on, where now you start to see lower temperatures. So chemistry starts to play a role. It's not it's not instantaneous. When you bring the fuel molecule and the air molecule together because of turbulent diffusion, if the chemistry is too slow, then obviously the chemistry time scales have to be considered. So I think that's, that's the origin of those uh, statements that you referred to. If it's, if it's a flame propagation mode of combustion, if it's compression ignition, right, then it's purely the chemistry, if it's well mixed, fuel air mixture. Well, okay, I think that's what you just asked is a very key question. Uh, if you want to get your proposal funded, you have to stress the points that are still controversial, right? And to be very precise, if you go down to the thickness of a laminar flame in those length scales, you have to consider uh, the rate at which these fuel molecules and oxygen molecules are being brought together and reacting. So all of those processes are important down at the very small scale, especially for flamelit combustion. All right, but what I'm what I'm trying to point out here are the gross uh, controlling factors in these various combustion regimes. So we know in diesel combustion it's uh, turbulence mixing, in homogeneous charge compression ignition it's chemistry, in spark ignition engine combustion it is a mixture of the two. Around the 
So based on what I hear in schools, that you want to take two to be in order of the one micron to ten micron, right. and then you have a total mass to fit in the Right, so flame thickness, what do you mean by that? If you look at a turbulent brush, in other words, a collection of an ensemble of laminar flamelets, that can be on the order of a millimeter in thickness. But if you use your microscope and look side, inside that turbulent flame, and I showed a picture that Professor Law's group had, had produced, inside that turbulent flame, you have laminar flamelets whose thicknesses are on the order of 10, 20 microns. Right, so it depends on how you want to look at it. And there's, there's a lot of unsteadiness. Those, those flamelets are being distorted, they're strained, the surface area is very high. Uh, but if you just uh, smear over all of that internal structure and you look at the reactants going to the products, that can occur over a distance on the order of a millimeter. Maybe less. Yeah. All right, sure, thanks. Yeah. Right, so there's the question was what regime are you in in, an inter in a spike ignition flame propagation mode? You wouldn't get flame propagation unless you were in the appropriate part of that Borghi diagram, uh, or uh, I guess that's what it's called. Um, so the answer is yeah, uh, and there's a fairly large range over which you can have flame uh, propagation. But remember the flame speeds and the flame thickness depends on transport coefficients, which depend on pressure, temperature. So uh, you know if you um, if you look at a, a spark ignition engine, you, or let's say a natural gas engine, and you try to ignite it. Uh, with the spark plug, you find that there's only a limited range of equivalence ratios over which you can actually uh, sustain a propagating flame. Uh, and again, going back to the diagram, you'd be able to see the reasons for that. Okay, any other questions? All right, so today uh, I want to just briefly talk about fuels uh, and uh, a little bit about after treatment and control. Um, the context will be uh, largely around compression ignition engines, and in particular, the HCCI, PCCI, and RCCI that we started talking about yesterday. Uh, and then I'll finish off later today with a brief discussion about, okay, you've got this engine, it has to work in a vehicle, what are the considerations there? And then we'll finish up with future engines. So. We were very interested in the impact of fuels on these advanced combustion regimes. And so we designed an experiment, which I think I've mentioned to you before, but just reviewed over here, where the internal combustion engine was outfitted with two port fuel injectors so that uh, the fresh air uh, would be mixed with uh, potentially two different fuels. Uh, we chose to use uh, N-heptane and iso-octane as representative surrogates for diesel fuel and gasoline. And then the engine was also equipped with a direct injector, uh, a common rail diesel type injector. And this allowed us to look at several combustion regimes, for example, HCCI. So in HCCI, we had two different uh, blends of these uh, uh, PRF fuels chosen in such a way to be able to control the 50% burn point crank angle. Uh, we wanted that to be somewhere around top dead center. And uh, all of this was done with a fixed intake temperature. Uh, for RCCI, we basically used a neat iso-octane uh, in the uh, port injectors, all right? and then the direct inject injector used N-heptane, like we were discussing uh, yesterday when we spoke about gasoline and diesel. Then for PPC, or partially premixed combustion, sometimes called PCCI, we wanted to use a single fuel, as you would do uh, in that strategy. And we chose a fuel that had a gasoline-like reactivity of uh, uh, PRF of 94, uh, because there's a lot of interest in using basically gasoline compression ignition, using gasoline in a diesel engine. 
and to exploit the fact that because gasoline is less reactive, you have more time available for mixing of the fuel and the air in that way, lowering the local equivalence ratios in the combustion chamber and avoiding soot. And by diluting the mixture, you can lower the temperatures and avoid NOx. So these are three advanced combustion regimes or strategies that we wanted to compare. And the main thing we were really interested in was the control of the combustion process. How much control do you have with these three different strategies? Uh, it's the same engine I discussed last time, the GM 1.9 liter automotive diesel engine, compression ratio 17 to one. Um, the bowl, the piston bowl, was one of those shallow disc bowls, disc-shaped bowls that I mentioned before, uh, half liter uh, displacement. Um, and you can see some of the other uh, parameters of interest here. It's a standard port fuel injector and a Bosch common rail uh, low pressure injection. So controllability of combustion. What we decided to do was to set up uh, a baseline operating condition, 5.5 bar, 1500 RPM, uh, and run the engine in these three operating modes and try to keep the combustion phasing the same. So the CA50 would be the same from these three, uh, these, uh, three strategies. We used single direct injections for the, uh, the PCCI or PPC combustion strategy and also for the RCCI. Of course, the RCCI had, in addition, port fuel injection of the low reactivity fuel. And as you can see from the results here, the NOx levels were extremely low. Uh, so these are all uh, classified as uh, 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 low temperature combustion strategies. Uh, you can see the global equivalence ratios were roughly the same, so we're operating lean combustion here. Um, the global PRF, that means the, uh, the fuel reactivity, is roughly the same for all three strategies. The difference was uh, basically in how much premixed fuel it was introduced into the combustion chamber. So for HCCI, all of the fuel was premixed in the port injection. For RCCI, most of the fuel was the uh, less reactive fuel introduced in the port fuel injection and the remainder was direct injected. So you only need a small amount of the reactive fuel to get the combustion going. And then uh, the premixed fuel uh, for the PPC case was uh, around 80% and the rest was direct injected. So here you have a fixed fuel composition, PRF 94. The timing of injection, of course, is only relevant for the two, uh, the PPC and the RCCI cases. So looking at the results here from this case, we had roughly the same CA50 or combustion timing. Uh, the efficiencies were fairly good for an automotive diesel uh, in the 45 to 47% range. Uh, you'll notice that the combustion efficiencies were not that good. That wasn't really the goal of this effort here. Um, uh, to try to optimize the uh, efficiency. It was more to say, we've got a baseline condition. Let's see how controllable the combustion process or the engine operation is. Pressure rise rates were much lower for RCCI, you can see here, than for the two uh, uh, premixed, uh, more premixed cases with um, uh, HCCI and PPC. So the experiment that we then uh, pursued was to say, all right, in a real world engine operation, you're running at this operating point. If the intake temperature were to change, like you suddenly drive through a tunnel or, or uh, you drive to a new location where the uh, intake temperatures are higher by say 10 degrees or lower by 10 degrees, what would you need to do to the combustion process to get back to the CA50 that you were comfortably running at at your baseline operating point. So you can see with HCCI, if I lower the uh, intake temperature by 10 degrees, my uh, combustion, that means I go to minus 10 C, my combustion retards, right? Uh, if I increase the intake temperature by 10 degrees, my combustion advances. And that is true for all of these combustion strategies, right? If I uh, lower the temperature, the combustion retards, and why is that? Well, because the combustion is controlled by chemical kinetics, which is very sensitive to temperature. So now the issue is I've done this, I've made this change. 
can I do something to the system to bring the temperature, the uh, combustion back to the baseline uh, combustion phasing? So with uh, HCCI, <coughs> it turns out I can do that. I can compensate if the temperature uh, is uh, reduced here. So I went to, I, I retarded my uh, combustion timing. I can, by having those two injectors in the port, change the ratio of the isooctane and the n-heptane to make the mixture a little bit more reactive. So use less of the less reactive fuel, more of the more reactive fuel. And in that way, I can bring the phasing back to where it was in my baseline case. Similarly, I can do that with the increased temperature case. And in the, at the end of the day, I am able to maintain my CA50 uh, to be pretty much what it was in the baseline and still keep good uh, low emissions combustion. I can do the same thing with RCCI. With RCCI, uh, if I change the premixed fuel amount by allowing uh, less of the less reactive fuel, I can bring my phasing back to the baseline uh, timing. And uh, of course, compensate by injecting more of the more reactive fuel directly. Uh, I don't have to do anything to the injection timing. Uh, I can keep it the way it was. All I do is change the gas diesel ratio or the isooctane uh, and heptane ratio, and I can bring the phasing back. The problem is when you have a single fuel. So with a single fuel, it turns out you can bring the timing back to the baseline timing when you've lowered the intake temperature. But you, the only way, you, the knob that you really have is how much fuel you in directly inject and the injection timing. So by reducing the uh, amount of premixed fuel and adding more direct injected fuel, you can locally increase the equivalence ratio, make the fuel a little bit more reactive, and in that way, bring the timing back to where you wanted it. The problem, though, is that now you have much larger gradients in equivalence ratio in the combustion chamber, which lead to locally higher temperatures, and now you see a big increase in NOx. Uh, going in the other direction, for the plus uh, 10 degrees, you really don't have a whole lot of uh, options available. You can go to pretty much, uh, all you can really do is go toward the HCCI limit. And we were, in this case, not able to continue, go all the way up to the HCCI limit, because in order to get the combustion phasing to be uh, roughly the same for these three combustion strategies, we had to run with a slightly higher intake temperature for PPC. So uh, what this slide really shows you is that the flexibility that you have with having two fuels really allows for significant combustion control. And let me just look at that PPC case a little, in a little more detail. Here's the table you saw on the previous slide, and here's that graph. So if you look at using the uh, injection timing to try to control the combustion, and here we're talking about this uh, plus 10 degrees case, we want to bring it back to the solid line, the baseline timing. Uh, you can see that um, I just don't have a lot of control if I, uh, if I start going with early injection. The only time I have control is by going to later injections, injections closer to TDC. And when I do that, you, as I mentioned, your uh, NOx increases. And similarly, if I try to change the amount of premixed fuel, uh, in other words, to uh, uh, increase that, that uh, local equivalence ratio, again, all I can do is change the combustion timing by about a, a degree or two. I just don't have the uh, control that I would have uh, with two fuels. Okay, so that indicates that uh, these advanced combustion regimes are very sensitive to intake temperature and to compensate for changes in temperature, um, it's actually very difficult to do with a single fuel. Same thing applies when you have intake pressure variations. And this is crucial if you're talking about a transient engine. You put your foot on the gas pedal, the turbocharger takes a while to ramp up in, in, uh, in operation, and so you're going to have fluctuations in intake pressure uh, during this process. And so here we looked at uh, changing the intake pressure by 10 kPa, or 10%, uh, plus or minus, 
for this uh, close to naturally aspirated case. There's no EGR, by the way, in any of these experiments. Uh, and as you can see, looking at the HCCI case here, if I increase the intake pressure by 10 kPa, I increase my kinetics, reactivity of the fuel, and so I get advanced combustion. If I reduce the intake pressure by 10 kPa, kinetics slows down and I get retarded combustion. The same thing is true for these other combustion modes. Uh, interestingly though, you see less of an effect in RCCI. And this tells you and hints that the, the fuels that we're dealing with respond differently to changes in pressure. Uh, in particular, the ignition process and so on is really controlled by the n-heptane fuel, which is a two-stage fuel, and it's less sensitive to pressure variations than the uh, iso-octane fuel, which characterizes uh, these two cases. But nevertheless, they all show some sensitivity to intake pressure variation. So we did the same thing here. So what would you need to do to bring the combustion phasing back to the baseline value with these fluctuations in pressure. For the HCCI and the RCCI, where we have two fuels and we're basically changing the ratio of the isooctane and heptane to control the PRF number, which then controls ignition timing, we have no problem doing uh, matching the data. However, once again, with just a single fuel, no matter what we do to change the injection timing or the, the amount of premixed fuel. Uh, you can see here we uh, had uh, very little premixed fuel by comparison with the baseline and uh, the uh, plus 10 kPa case. Um, and all that that did was bring us into uh, uh, very large NOx emissions. Uh, for that case, we could kind of get back to the timing that uh, was uh, desired. But for the, the uh, advanced case, we just ran out of ability to re-time or re-phase the combustion. So uh, when it comes to engine control, these are issues, these are real issues. And one of the things that I guess a lot of people overlook when they read papers in the literature showing results with these advanced combustion strategies uh, is the fact that, yeah, you can get the engine to run at one operating point. But now, in the real world, you have to uh, compensate for variations in the intake conditions. Uh, and, you know, as, uh, as you're driving down the highway, this is something that uh, is a reality. Uh, and if your combustion strategy doesn't allow you to make these compensations, that's just not going to make it into a, a practical combustion system. So in order to explore this further, we uh, have a very unique uh, piece of uh, equipment in our lab. Uh, we have that GM 1.9 liter engine in a multi-cylinder configuration. Uh, and it is attached to a fast response dynamometer. It's a hydrostatic dynamometer that allows you to, uh, ex to impose very rapid transients on the engine. Rapid transients, 2,500 RPM per second. So you can essentially have an instantaneous change of speed or load imposed on the engine through the load control that this dynamometer offers. And um, we have used this in a series of experiments in uh, Reed Hansen's PhD thesis. You can read about it, where basically <coughs> um, what he did was to uh, impose uh, sudden speed changes or sudden load changes. We have the engine instrumented with uh, uh, fast response hydrocarbon and NOx analyzers, uh, the combustion uh, system. So you can actually, in a, uh, during a transient, watch what happens to the engine out NOx or hydrocarbons uh, in response to this sudden change in operating conditions. And using those results, you can develop strategies for controlling the engine uh, uh, operating conditions. For example, if you are measuring in-cylinder pressures, which is what we have been doing uh, as well, the engine is instrumented with in-cylinder pressure transducers, you can monitor the CA50 or the 50% the burn point during the transient 
and compensate in the next cycle if you see that uh, CA50 is starting to retire, well, you better add a little bit more, more reactive fuel. So you'd increase the amount of direct injected fuel for that next cycle at expense of less of the port injected fuel. And so in this way, <coughs> with an co engine control system, you can maintain the combustion phasing. So this is the engine here. Uh, it is a turbocharged uh, diesel engine. Uh, we have both high pressure and low pressure EGR, although in the experiments I'm going to discuss, EGR was not used. We find that EGR is actually benef beneficial at very light loads and also, again, at high loads. But for intermediate loads, it's really not necessary for RCCI combustion. Uh, it's just a little bit more detail here, which you've seen before uh, about this engine. But this is a multi-cylinder version of the engine. So here are just some sample results from Reed's uh, PhD thesis. <clears throat> what he did here, this is cycle number, right? Starting at cycle zero, we changed the engine load from one bar to four bar VMEP. Uh, and this was done within three or four engine cycles, right? So pretty much an instantaneous change. Uh, so some guy put his foot on the accelerator, right? Uh, when we were at one bar, we were running with 41% of the fuel, port fuel injected, and whatever the rest is, 59% was uh, direct injected. As I mentioned to you before, at very light loads, we run the engine pretty much like a diesel engine. So here you can see at light loads, we have predominantly the more reactive fuel. Uh, from our steady state tests, going to four bar, we would prefer to have less direct injected fuel, more of the uh, port fuel injected fuel. So we, our goal was to reach 77% uh, of the port fuel. So what I'm showing you here is CA50. Uh, also, we, uh, in some optimization tests, showed that it's actually preferable to have slightly early combustion at light loads, and then CA50 is around five degrees uh, for higher loads. The two curves here correspond to using open loop control versus closed loop control. So the open loop control, basically, we just have tables of data that tell you for a, a given operating condition what you should be using for your gas diesel ratio. Closed loop is using the feedback uh, pressure data. And you can see we're able to control the engine and keep it uh, pretty stable. And while doing that, if you look down at this plot, this is the NOx as a function of cycle. We maintain very low NOx without a significant, any significant evidence of having changed the load uh, by this amount. On the other hand, if you look at conventional diesel combustion, uh, this is with the stock uh, engine control system for the Euro 4 calibration. It's a very good uh, calibration. You'll notice that the CA50 is very late here. It's like 15 degrees after top dead center. And again, the calibration chooses that to try to keep NOx as low as possible. But you see that during the step transient, it's not able to keep the NOx low. Uh, and instead, you have a huge overshoot in NOx. And then the controller starts to see, it starts using EGR. The turbocharger is starting to come back up to speed. Uh, with the increased airflow, and eventually it's able to bring the NOx back down. But during this process here, you see during that transient a significant amount of NOx production, which is, of course, a concern if you're catching the NOx in a, in a federal test, for instance. Uh, a lot of the NOx is being produced during those transient moments. So that's uh, one example that shows that as far as NOx is concerned, uh, RCCI combustion with this extra knob of being able to change the two fuels gives you tremendous control. Here we are looking at hydrocarbons, and the story is a little different here. With com uh, conventional diesel combustion, the, the engine out hydrocarbons are relatively low, right? And if you look at RCCI combustion, the engine out hydrocarbons are higher. Uh, this is after the, the uh, diesel oxidation catalyst. Um, but the engine out uh, unburned hydrocarbons are, of course, much higher. So you can see the, the reduction here has been because the catalyst has been doing its job. 
During this uh, transient, we actually see a spike in the hydrocarbons going into the catalyst uh, and then eventually reaching the steady state level. So you could see there's probably room for some more calibration uh, improvements here. But nevertheless, uh, you see you have this control capability. Now, one of the reasons why we think you see an overshoot in the hydrocarbon is if you go back to the engine layout, uh, we are port fuel injecting the gasoline or the low reactivity fuel. And as is known in spark ignition engines, uh, you tend to get puddling of the fuel in the intake ports. And so it takes several cycles before you can actually accommodate a change in load in, an in, in a spark ignition engine. And so the calibrations are quite complicated because they actually take into account the amount of wall film fuel in the ports during a transient and then back off on the injected fuel amounts or increase the injected fuel amounts depending on whether you're going in an upload or a download. So it becomes quite complicated and we didn't have any of that in our calibration. So that's one of the reasons why we think we saw that increase in uh, hydrocarbons. <clears throat> so fuels, you see I've discussed with you that fuels are important. And so we also have been looking at other fuels, and in particular, ethanol. So I'm going to compare here conventional diesel. This is data that I showed you yesterday for the uh, Cummins engine from Sandia running on diesel fuel. Uh, we also uh, collaborated with the group at Lund University who are running partially premixed combustion uh, with ethanol fuel. Uh, and then dual fuel RCCI, where we ran our Caterpillar engine with ethanol as the low reactivity fuel and diesel as the high reactivity fuel. Actually, we used E85, uh, which is very close to ethanol in its uh, characteristics. You see the engines are large, heavy duty engines, uh, displacements around two liters per cylinder, uh, similar size engines. Compression ratios vary quite a bit. The reason this one's low, remember, is that it's an optical engine and to get the compression ratio to be more realistic, uh, the intake temperatures and so on were uh, increased to make the temperatures and pressures the same at TDC as in a 16 to 1 engine. So this movie just uh, reminds you of what's happening here. We're looking at a sector of a combustion chamber. I think this one had a seven hole nozzle. So looking one seventh of the 360 degree combustion chamber. Uh, the color scheme is the blue shows the liquid, the yellow shows the vapor. It's a single injection early. Remember, this is the low temperature combustion case, 22 degrees before top dead center, um, and with high EGR to achieve low temperature combustion. So this one is the ethanol PPC. <clears throat> so basically here, some of the ethanol is port injected or early injected. Uh, and then we have a single injection at 60 degrees before top dead center. Uh, so it looks very similar to the diesel case. And then finally for the uh, RCCI case, we looked at two different situations, one with gasoline as the low reactivity fuel or with E85, so we could compare with the ethanol here. Uh, direct injection of the diesel fuel, we had two injections, there's one, there's the second using the recipe that I discussed with you yesterday. So we're comparing these cases. So first, let's just look at the differences between running with gasoline as your low reactivity fuel versus ethanol. And we're comparing here the pressure trace versus crank angle for E85 and diesel and gasoline and diesel. And there's two curves in each case, one being the experiment and one being the simulation. And you can see, if you look at the ethanol, you have a much lower pressure rise rate, and that shows up here also in the shape of the heat release curve. The gasoline has a more uh, HCCI-like combustion uh, trace. Uh, so using the simulation, we can look in at every computational cell in the domain and determine the local uh, PRF number, or if you like, the octane number, uh, in each computational cell and add up the amount of mass that is at that octane number and in that way you get a distribution of mass fraction versus octane number. 
And if you look at the E85 diesel case, and we're looking here at 20 degrees before top dead center, that's just about where combustion is starting to happen um, over here, right? Uh, you see that there's a wide range of octane number in the combustion chamber when we run with ethanol as the low reactivity fuel, going all the way to over 100 here. Uh, whereas with the gasoline diesel, you have a much smaller range of octane number uh, stratification. Uh, going only up to 90-something. Uh, uh, actually, it would be 100, right, with, if you were running with iso-octane. Um, so you can see that one of the differences between uh, running with ethanol or gasoline is that you have less control over the reactivity stratification. Uh, there are, of course, other things that are really interesting, and that is if you look at the low-temperature combustion part, the behavior of ethanol ignition and gasoline or uh, iso-octane ignition is quite different. And that's what gives you this lower uh, rate of pressure rise for the case of ethanol. I'll talk more about that in a, in a minute. Uh, so we can, again, with the simulations, <coughs> compare the progress of reaction by looking at the fuel and combustion intermediates in the combustion chamber for these three situations. So here we have fuel undergoing first stage combustion to produce aldehydes, formaldehyde, so we track that. And then the second stage combustion, we track the OH. So looking at diesel, low temperature diesel combustion, uh, we inject the fuel, it cooks for a while, you start to see the development of these first stage combustion products, the formaldehyde, and at a certain moment, the temperatures uh, become appropriate for second stage ignition, and you start to see OH being produced and the formaldehydes being uh, consumed. So that's kind of what we would expect from diesel combustion. If we look at the ethanol, partially premixed combustion, here's your ethanol, essentially very slow uh, consumption, uh, so long delay, long uh, time of uh, ignition delay. And then you start to see the formation of those inter intermediate aldehydes and, again, a long, relatively long delay uh, till the, the second stage combustion kicks in. For the dual fuel combustion, it's kind of interesting because now you look at the diesel trace, the black line here, and you see that at a certain moment the diesel fuel starts being consumed. You see a lot of formaldehyde being formed, but the, uh, the ethanol and the gasoline or the isooctane uh, remember, we're running E85 here, hardly uh, cons are consumed at all. So basically, the ignition is being controlled by the diesel fuel, as you would expect. Once you start to see the second stage combustion kick in, the OH starts to appear. At that point, you start to see temperatures rise sufficiently that the ethanol uh, and isooctane start to become consumed. So if we look at the... <coughs> Differences in the heat release event, this is the apparent heat release um, as a percentage of the fuel energy versus time. This is shown in milliseconds here because we're interested in chemistry here. Uh, for diesel, you, you see that premixed burns, little one here, and then the second uh, diffusion burn. For the ethanol, there's a long delay uh, followed by uh, essentially an HCCI type combustion strategy. Whereas with the RCCI, you have this prolonged burn because you're essentially burning one fuel and then the second fuel, which represents the mixture of the two fuels, and then finally the second fuel by itself. So this gives you a lot of control over the combustion process, <coughs> even with different fuels. In this case, we're running ethanol diesel. So <coughs> a lot of people, when you tell them about the idea of using two fuels, essentially close the door behind you and say we're not interested. Right? So the issue is, could you run these engines with one fuel? Uh, so because of the fuel flexibility, we decided to look at the use of additives to make the less reactive fuel become more reactive. There are additives that can make a more reactive fuel less reactive, but they generally you need huge percentages of these additives to go in that direction. But going in the other direction, is, it turns out to be uh, much more practical. 
So one of the additives is ethyl hexyl nitrate. So here's your nitrate group uh, and attached to an isoalkane. Um, the one problem with this is that there's nitrogen in the fuel. So you have to worry about the, its contribution to nitric oxide. And so we'll discuss that a little bit. Uh, there are other uh, uh, additives such as ditert butyl peroxide. They generally have slightly less reactivity than uh, EHN. And so here's some data from the literature comparing EHN and uh, DTBP. But the bottom line is that with, say, 3% addition of EHN, you can increase the CTA number by 30 points. So that's a lot of uh, improvement in ign ignitability. And here just shows some experimental results on our Caterpillar engine, in this case using DTBP. And you can see here that, um, it's hard to tell, but just looking at the heat release curve, we have the baseline diesel case. And then by adding a few percent of DTBP to gasoline, we're able to, and in this case, this was 89% uh, port fueling. Um, by adding just a few percent of uh, DTBP to the direct injected fuel, which is about 10% of the total fuel, uh, times this percent, so we're talking about less than a percent of the total fuel, you can maintain the same timings uh, and so on. Okay, so we then decided to see, okay, well, what do you have to do to make a diesel engine operate on gasoline with an additive? So we compared E10, which is gasoline from the gas station down the road, although in this case we had, uh, we splash blended the ethanol with uh, ethanol-free gasoline from down the road um, with diesel, right? And so I'm showing you here E10 plus 3% uh, EHN operating at 5 bar, 1900 RPM. And uh, we want to compare that with diesel. So if we ran this same case with uh, diesel fuel with the same uh, uh, start of... Uh, injection, all right, this is start of injection combined, and same injection pressure. We got similar combustion, but a little different. You could see more of a premix burn and so on than we saw with the EHN gasoline. But by making a small adjustment to the diesel timing, so going to nine degrees instead of 11, and then by lower, uh, increasing the injection pressure, um, I beg your pardon, lowering, where, where am I now, 7.9, yeah, by uh, increasing the injection pressure for the diesel fuel, we were able to match the EHN uh, gasoline mixture with diesel fuel. So basically, uh, there's a slight difference in reactivity between gasoline plus EHN that required a two degree change here or a three degree change in uh, timing, actually total four degrees uh, roughly. Uh, and then the injection pressure, the reason that we thought you needed to make that change was because the gasoline is a lot more volatile than the diesel. Uh, and so compensating by increasing the injection pressure for the diesel, we could get pretty much the same combustion uh, characteristic. So essentially with slight changes in the injection timing and injection pressure, going to lower injection pressures, you can use E10 plus ethyl hexyl nitrate instead of diesel fuel. And you only need 3%. Okay, so uh, we also compared for those same combustion cases uh, in the engine what the emissions looked like. So here's the E10 plus EHN. Here's the diesel fuel with the slightly adjusted uh, injection timing and injection pressure. Uh, you can see the NOx. This is diesel combustion, right? So the NOx, of course, is much higher than the EPA regulations here. But nevertheless, it's the same for the two fuels. Similarly for the soot. Okay, so having established that, we now went to uh, RCCI combustion. So we're going to compare diesel gasoline and E10 EHN RCCI. Uh, so we port fuel inject E10 and we direct inject E10 with 3% EHN mixed in it and compare the results with gasoline port injected and direct injected diesel. And as you can see, we're able to match the uh, results very closely here. Um, here with the conditions, this was that 5.5 bar case, engine speed 1900 RPM. 
Notice we had to use slightly more uh, of the direct injected fuel for the EH for the E10 e, EHN. Um, so this is roughly 70% versus 80% premixed. Uh, the combustion, the injection timings, we actually kept the same, used the same recipe because they're very early in RCCI, so there's not a lot of sensitivity to the timing. Uh, and we used the higher injection pressure in the diesel case, as I mentioned. No EGR in these tests. And if you look at the emissions that resulted from the use of these two fuels, we compared this at two operating points here, five bar and nine bar. You see slightly more NOx with the, the EHN gasoline or the low reactivity fuel mixture with EHN. As you might expect, right, this extra NOx comes from that nitrogen atom in the fuel. Notice, however, that the 2010 emissions regulations, which we kind of use as a, a metric, are about 0.25 up here. So we're still meeting 2010 emissions uh, levels. Uh, and of course, at higher load, the NOx is even lower. Uh, looking at the soot, we have this cleaner gasoline without those aromatic components and so on that you would have uh, in diesel fuel. So we actually see a reduction in soot, but these numbers are so small anyway that it's hard to say what the accuracy of that data is. Uh, and then here, the gross indicated efficiencies are very similar. Okay, so that uh, led us to this set of estimates here. Assume that I can create a gasoline, uh, sell you a gasoline car that operates with a diesel engine, uh, and I have a supply reservoir of additive. How much additive will I need to be able to uh, satisfy you between oil change intervals? So we took those five operating points that I discussed with you last time that came from the uh, ad hoc working group at Oak Ridge National Lab. And we, uh, using the results that I've just showed you here, estimated how much additive would be required over the light duty drive cycle, using the area of each of these bullets here to give you an, an idea of how much uh, each of those modes contributes. And what we found was that the light duty drive cycle averages 55% port fuel injected fuel. So 45% of the fuel had to be additized, right? And it's direct injected. And we said that we could operate with 3% EHN. So that means that the total EHN requirement is 1.4% of the fuel needed. So here's just a, a chart that shows the fuel and additive volumes. Um, if you want to drive at 50 miles per gallon, which we estimate is a reasonable estimate, uh, as I'll show you later as well, uh, and uh, 10,000 mile oil change interval, uh, you would need 200 gallons of fuel. Uh, of that fuel, the amount that needs to be additized is 89 gallons, and how much additive you would need to do the 3% here is 2.7 gallons. So basically, this is like a big windshield wiper bottle of additive every 10,000 miles. Uh, so this is actually really competitive with SCR uh, technologies because they use uh, uh, additives more or less in the same proportion. So we think you could operate these engines with one fuel and a tank of fluid. And people say, oh, you're going to add another fluid to my car. Well, if you start thinking about how, much, how many fluids you have in your car, you start getting an education, right? You've got windshield wiper fluids, you've got oils, transmission oils, gearbox oils. Yeah, I mean, the number of different uh, fluids that, you, if you count the air in the tires as well, the number of fluids that you have to add to a vehicle is, is quite amazing. We're saying, well, you can do one more here and replace the SCR fluid that you uh, would have used otherwise. Yeah. So, right, the question that you're asking is uh, real drive cycles versus these uh, FTP cycles. Uh, no, we have not done that. I've seen some of those results. Um, I know Bosch had some papers where they showed that the FTP cycles don't represent reality at all. 
<laughs> there's people typically drive way faster than uh, is assumed in those cycles. We haven't looked at that yet. It's something that would be interesting to look at, though. Okay, so we just spoke about gasoline. <clears throat> How about other fuels? Well, we also have been looking at natural gas diesel. We uh, have started doing some experiments on the heavy-duty engine, but before doing them, we did quite a bit of simulation work, and I want to tell you about that uh, briefly. Um, so here I'm looking at natural gas diesel RCCI, and we covered in the simulations a wide range of operating points going from 4 bar light load uh, to 23 bar high load. Here's the load versus speed chart for the engine. Here's your torque curve, and these are the points that we chose uh, in the study. It's the Caterpillar engine, the 2.4 liter displacement, 16 to 1 compression ratio. Uh, and uh, we did a GA, a genetic algorithm study, where we changed the six parameters you see here. The amount of methane, the amount of uh, diesel fuel injected in the two pulses, um, and the, uh, the timings, uh, and then the amount in the first injection, and then the diesel injection pressure, and finally the EGR rate. The simulations were done with our Kiva model. Uh, with PRF kinetics <coughs> to represent the diesel fuel. We used the non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm in an improvement over the uh, standard genetic algorithm that I told you about yesterday. Uh, 32 citizens per generation. We ran for 40 generations. So that's about 1,000 runs at each of these points here. Um, so that's a lot of comput computations. Uh, using the UW Condor system, those 4,000 computers that I told you about uh, on campus. And here are the results. <clears throat> so uh, there's a huge amount of data. You look through the data uh, critically to find the best operating points. Um, what we found here are the operating conditions again, 800 to 1800 RPM as we covered the load range. Uh, what you see is that EGR isn't really required until you get to very high loads. Uh, and that, again, is because of this low reactivity natural gas that you're using. Uh, so that's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, the injection timings and so on are quite different than our conventional gasoline injection uh, timings. Uh, we want earlier first injection, later second injection. Um, Anyway, that you can look at those details later if you're interested. But the bottom line is we're able to keep low soot, low NOx, except at the very high uh, load point, the soot exceeds the EPA regulation, which is about 0 0.01. Um, the efficiencies are in the 50% range, uh, so that's pretty good. And I'll discuss the reasons why it's a little lower than with gasoline in a minute. Uh, pressure rise rates are low and acceptable. Uh, and even the uh, CO and unburned hydrocarbons are reasonable, although at light load, you start to see some issues. So here we compare <coughs> gasoline diesel RCCI with natural gas diesel RCCI. And we're operating the two different cases here, nine bar IMEP with different boost pressures. So a high boost pressure case and a low boost pressure case. And these results, you can see, you can achieve similar combustion timings or phasings with the two different fuels. Um, here are the uh, operating parameters, the gross parameters uh, that we used. Uh, let's see if there's anything to point out here. Um, yes, the gasoline case was run with EGR, uh, whereas the natural gas doesn't require EGR. Quite similar. Uh, strategies, though. Uh, differences, though, in the amount of um, low reactivity fuel, slight differences, and also in the, the uh, timings of injection. And here are the results. So let's first look at the uh, low injection pressure, uh, the low uh, boost pressure cases. You'll see that the uh, natural gas has higher NOx than the gasoline case, but the uh, soot emissions are fairly low for all of these cases. 
This is the nine bar point, right? Uh, fairly low unburnt hydrocarbons and CO. Uh, notice that the um, gross indicated efficiency for natural gas is less than for gasoline. Uh, pressure rise rate is lower for natural gas than for gasoline. Notice also that if I increase the boost pressure, I don't see much of a difference in NOx emissions for gasoline, but I see a huge difference for natural gas. So that dilution effect uh, with going with a higher boost pressure really has a, plays a role in uh, the nitric oxide. So why is the efficiency lower with natural gas? Let me ask you guys a question. What would you expect the burnt gas temperature to be for natural gas versus with uh, gasoline? Higher or lower? So this is an adiabatic flame temperature question. And you're all combustion guys. You should be able to answer that real quick. It's a trick question, though. OK, so here's one answer. Natural gas has a lower temperature in a boiler. In an engine, natural gas has higher temperature. And the reason for that is if you look at the uh, energy equation, you see the fuel-air ratio and the temperature make a difference because the specific heat uh, enters into the, uh, the adiabatic flame temperature calculation. So there would be significant differences in a boiler versus in an engine. And it turns out that in a natural gas uh, engine, even though at room type conditions, the temperature of natural gas um, is lower than would be for, say, iso-octane, at uh, engine conditions, it's actually higher. So uh, that's why you see more heat loss, the higher in cylinder temperatures, which lead to lower uh, growth efficiencies. So that was kind of an education. Uh, so you are actually doing better with gasoline than you would be doing with uh, natural gas. So just to finish this, uh, and then we'll take a break. I, I mentioned that there was problems at light load with NOx and at high load with soot. What we've done uh, beyond that is to go from double injections, uh, the blue here you see are double injections at light load, to triple injections, the yellows that you see here. And so, and we've done that also at 23 bar. And if you compare the results, you see here that by going to the triple injection, keep the soot roughly the same, but we decrease the NOx significantly, uh, and at the same time increase the efficiency. And you can see that by looking at the energy breakdown here, the combustion losses are where you really gain by going to the triple injection. You're basically eliminating that big octane number disparity between the two fuels the, uh, by having a better mixing. Uh, and then at the high load point, you see the same thing, the double injections here replaced by GA optimized triple injection. Again, you see improvements in the combustion efficiency which then gains you a significant amount of gain in the gross efficiency and reduction in unburned fuel. And in the big uh, advantage here is you bring the soot down. So if you look carefully at this, you'll see the last injection is at around 10 degrees after top dead center. And you might say, well, I've already started combustion and I'm injecting into burning gases. How come I don't get a lot of soot? And this movie here shows the reason for that. I'll quit right here. So basically, I'm looking at temperature contours. Here comes that last injection. You notice it didn't ignite, right? It was injecting into a region of the combustion chamber where combustion hadn't started. Uh, and it's because of that that you don't see a lot of soot being formed from that last injection. So these uh, GAs are able to find uh, operating conditions that you probably would never have thought of. Uh, and I think it's a really powerful uh, tool. So let's hold off on questions till after the break, and, and let's start up again at 10 o'clock, and we can take questions then.